Joining us with their thoughts is security expert and president of Globe Risk International, Alan Bell, and in Ottawa, Isan Gardi, the executive director of the National Council of Canadian Muslims. Gentlemen, good to have you both with us. And Alan, I want to start with you from a security standpoint. C-51 is now law. Are you in favor of it? I'm in favor of the actual bill itself, but there's certain things that need to be changed or amended as time goes by. We've got to remember that this bill was put together to combat terrorism, not extremism or people's opinions or whatever, whatever else there was. This was for terrorism. And at the moment, the biggest threat globally is the threat from Islamic fundamentalist terrorist groups. And we had to have something in place to enable our law enforcement agencies and our intelligence services to be able to assist them be able to combat this threat as it emerges over the, over the next couple of years. I want to bring Isan here and, and get your viewpoint on this. Isan, is it unreasonable, though, you know, that security agencies be able to talk to one another, communicate with more ease? Well, I think that uh, everybody can agree, Marcy, that national security is something very important. And certainly information sharing is an important step for national security agencies to be able to share information. But I think we also have to remember that there are lessons to be learned from the case, of, for example, of others uh, who have been wrongly accused. For example, Meher Arar is sort of the emblematic case that demonstrates what can go wrong when national security agencies don't have the proper and necessary oversight, uh, comprehensive oversight review uh, and redress mechanisms in place to make sure that they're operating within the bounds of the law. Is it possible, Alan, to have that balance between security and safety? I, in an ideal world, yes, it is. But the oversight issue is, has always been a problem. Who, who's overseeing whatever is happening? The other problem we have also is the fact that all these agencies, uh, whether the law enforcement intelligence agencies, they don't always work well together. And that is another problem. I mean, we're supposed to have fusion centers where there's a passage of information between all the various different agencies. That has not been really well received by a lot of these agencies. They prefer to keep things themselves. But oversight is the big issue, which everyone is concerned about, the civil libertarians, security people, the police, etc. Is there uh, some sort of disconnect, gentlemen? I want to put this uh, to Isan first. Is there a disconnect between uh, what our government has shared with us and what the general public uh, needs to know with regards to this issue? Well, I think the general public has you know, concerns and they've raised those concerns. Uh, and in addition to that, this is something that has been spoken about as well by four former prime ministers have written about this, expressing their concerns, former Supreme Court justices, heads of security intelligence review committees, privacy commissioners, and so forth. So this is something that, as we've seen, the bill was quite popular when it came into place, or when it was introduced, uh, but we've seen that popularity dropping as Canadians seem to learn more and more about this law. And legal experts from across this country, including Canadian national security law experts like Professor Craig Forsese and Kent Roach, who have just written this book called False Security, which uh, details in 600 pages uh, the problems with this bill. Uh, obviously, not everybody's going to have time to read that, so I'd recommend your listeners or your viewers uh, check out their website at anti antiterrorlaw.ca, uh, which has video vignettes, a uh, short video series uh, highlighting what are some of the problematic issues of this bill. Uh, one of the key points to remember is that, you know, it's important certainly to have a, a look at the law enforcement aspect side uh, of and national security, but as well, there has to be a focus on the prevention uh, of radicalization towards extremist violence, something that we've, that in our view has been sorely lacking and something that the, uh, the communities across this country uh, are working on on the front lines every day uh, to try and bring forward strategies uh, to effectively combat this issue which really affects all of us. Alan, can you pick up on that, the whole idea of, of prevention? Well, prevention is very difficult. I mean, this ended up as an omnibus, an omnibus bill. In other words, lots of things were put in there which weren't originally supposed to be in there. If you look at the UK, you look at Germany, you look at France, and you look at the US, they've all had similar problems that we're having with, with, with this bill. Uh, and they're slowly but surely changing it. But the problem is the, emergency th the emerging threats uh, of, of global terrorism we have to have something in place to enable us to be able to combat that threat. And maybe there's too much of one thing and not enough of another thing, etc., etc. But it's now gone through law. It's been passed, and we have to we have to deal with this. And I have no doubt that it'll be it'll be fought all the way through the courts in in, in the future. But we needed something to enable us to be able to protect Canadians. Uh, 
I want to get to quickly just the other bill, C-24, and this bill that would revoke citizenship for dual citizens and get your take on that. And then uh, last word for you, Issa. Well, well, one of the things that, that a lot of countries are now doing is the fact that if you are a citizen of, an, of another country, in other words, you're an immigrant to England or you're an immigrant to Canada, etc., and you become a Canadian citizen, and then you either plan or perpetrate a terrorist attack within the country that you are now living in as a new citizen, that that, that, that passport should be revoked. I agree with that to a certain degree because when people come to Canada from wherever, and I'm an immigrant myself, when I came to Canada I agreed uh, to uh, obey the laws of Canada. And if people come to this country and then they don't want to obey the laws of Canada, wh where is the government left? Now this may be a, a draconian method of doing it, but I don't see any other way. Once a person has been uh, tried, convicted of a terrorist attack which was going to kill Canadians, there's something should be more after they've served their jail time. They then should be sent back to their country of origin. Lisa, last word in your response. Well, I can see why people feel very strongly about this, but uh, we object to this bill for a number of reasons. Firstly, on the principle that it creates a two-tier uh, class of citizenship for citizens who can have their citizenship revoked and those who can't. But putting aside the practicality issue or the principle issues, let's look at the practicality side of things, Marcy. Uh, Let's say, for example, best case scenario, you have somebody who is convicted of a, uh, an offense who is a genuinely dangerous uh, individual and, you want, and you're trying to deport them. Basically, what you're doing is you're displacing the threat onto another country, and then you're not, will that country even accept that individual? Worst case scenario, you're sending somebody overseas to a country that perhaps embraces torture, for example, and that goes against all of our uh, established international uh, human rights and civil liberties norms, the rule of law, and it's not something that I think Canadian courts would look at very favorably. Isan Gardi, Alan Bell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Interesting you. conversation, gentlemen.